get my table for 12 minutes only in total. <laughs> Can everybody hear me in the back? Yeah. Great. So today I'm going to tell you about dumb active matter. And the reason I say that is because this is a very simple system. I even tell things which way to go, and you still see really intriguing collective effects. So the system that I'm talking about is I have particles, as illustrated in this schematic, that are in fluid, they're very close to a surface, and I'm going to cause them to rotate in a direction parallel to the surface. And so in this movie, you'll see what happens when I put many of these particles together. So these are about a micron in scale, so in this very zoomed out view in the movie, there are little tiny dots that you can barely see individual particles. And I've now gathered all the particles up to one side of the chamber, so you have this very uniform distribution. And when I start the movie playing, I'm going to start the field rotating like this, if you're looking from below. And you'll see that the particles start to translate, and then this uniform distribution is going to evolve into a shock-like structure, and that shock is going to become unstable. So let's turn the field off. See the shock up here? And now the shock has started to destabilize, and you see this fingering structure. You can see the tips of these fingers are much denser than the, the back that they're kind of trailing particles behind. So that went by really fast. Let me play it for you one more time. So uniform structure, shock, and then this destabilization. So this is a phenomenon we kind of stumbled across in the lab, and this is what I'm going to spend the rest of the talk telling you about. But before I get to that, I want to tell you just a little bit more about my system. So I said that these were colloidal particles, they're plastic, and they have a chunk of hematite in them, which makes them very heavy. And so they're going to be sedimented close to the bottom of my deep chamber, but they're still small, so thermal energy keeps them a little bit away. So you should think of these particles as being close to the surface, but not touching the surface. If you just look at their gravitational height, they're held about a micron away from the surface. And then, of course, the, these are small, so my Reynolds number is very small, so everything is going to be Stokes per G. Now, I said I rotate these particles, and I am able to do that because hematite has a very small permanent magnetic moment. So if I put on a rotating magnetic field like this, the particles are just going to follow the field. But the moment is really small, so you don't need to think about magnetic interactions between the particles. And once I start these spinning, what's going to happen is, of course, the fluid around them is going to start moving. So here's a plot showing what the flow field looks like around one of these rotating particles. And, of course, once you start the rotating, you saw in the movie, they start to translate. But the, what's interesting is this translation is actually quite slow compared to how fast the fluid is moving around the particles. So here, the color map on this plot has been scaled by the velocity that the particles are translating. And as you can see, even far from the particle, the fluid is moving much faster than they're actually going on their own. And so a natural consequence of this is if you put many of them together, they're going to be very strongly influenced by their neighbor's flow. So if I'm close to someone else, I'm actually going to move faster than I would if I was by myself. So you can see this. I have two systems at very different densities. If I turn on the same field and then you can see the higher density system, things move much, much faster. You can see that a little bit more quantitatively in this plot, where I just have a normalized velocity, where I've normalized everything by the single particle velocity, and I'm plotting it versus area fractions, so you can see that things just scale linearly with the density. And if you look at high densities, you're going almost 100 times faster than you would go if you were alone. So kind of the background of this system. So now we can go back to the beautiful instability I showed you on the first screen. And here's just some snapshots from that movie. And one thing that's very striking is in these fingers, they all seem like they have the same size. The system seems to be selecting a length scale. So that was our first question, is what's setting this finger size? And what this reminded me of, at least, and maybe reminds some of you of, is a, a huge class of fluid instabilities, where you have 
competing stresses that pick out a natural link scale in the system. So one thing that we thought might be a map for this problem is the admissible rate of Taylor instability. We have a heavy thing, a heavy fluid over a light fluid. This is gravitationally unstable, and when it destabilizes, it has this wavelength that's set by the competition between the viscosity of the fluid and by the driving, which in this case is given by gravity. So we thought, great, so let's change these things in our problem to change the driving. We're not going to change gravity. We're going to change the frequency we're spinning or how fast the particles are going, change the viscosity of the fluid, see how the wavelength changes, and now we can learn what are the control parameters for our system. So we did that here. I've changed both of these things by an order of magnitude, and as you can see, nothing much changed. There's some little differences between the pictures, but the link scale is still the same here. So as I'm just a more quantitative about that, no matter how we change the frequency or the viscosity of the fluid, the wavelength was always the same. And so clearly that idea didn't work out. That wasn't a good map for our problem. <coughs> and so we knew we needed to at least identify the control parameters in this problem to figure out what's going on. But it's a little hard to sweep parameters or parameter space quickly in experiments. It's much easier to do that in simulations. So we went across the street to our friends at Quran. Thanks, Let's Michelle. Help. <laughs> so yeah, uh, actually, yeah, we crossed the street because they were too lazy to uh, to cross the street. So we came to their office. Uh, but yeah, that's what happened. <laughs> okay. So we tried to simulate the system uh, with a numerical method that we had developed just a few months ago, so it was really a timely uh, question. And basically we just used hydrodynamic interactions between the particles and the walls, uh, and this including uh, a lot of particles. Uh, as they do in the experiment, we prescribe the rotation of the particles by solving a resistance problem. And here we do not take into account thermal diffusion, so it means that the height of the particle here is just the balance between gravity and the repulsive potential that we prescribe away from the wall. So here is, for instance, uh, an example of simulation, where here we have 15,000 particles. All the parameters are the same as in the experiment. Um, so I let the video uh, go. And basically, you see that with our simulations, we recover uh, all the features of the experiment, namely the formation of the shock, then the shock destabilizes, and then the fingering. So of course, what is uh, nice with simulation is that you can control the parameter space. And here we wanted to see what was the effect of the height of the particles uh, for this instability. So what we did is that we just confined the particles in a plane above the wall at a given height, but still kept a 3D flow field. So here we're going to see a video with blue particles, which are close to the wall, and red particles, which are twice further away from the wall. And two simulations are run on top of each other. And you can see that even in 2D on the plane, uh, you recover the figure in stability and that in indeed the wavelength seems to depend strongly on the distance to the wall. If you want to quantify that, you can look at the wavelengths of the instability with the height and you see that it is proportional uh, to the height. So we crossed the street again, went back to see our friends from physics and told them maybe you could try to change the gravitational height of your particles to see if it affects the wavelengths of the instability. And that's what they managed to do. And you will see on the left here the particles have a much higher gravitational height, and you can see that the size of the structure is much bigger than on the right, where the gravitational height is smaller. So it seems that indeed the wavelength uh, is controlled by the height uh, to the wall. So, <laughs> so okay, we we so we managed to reproduce their experiment with our 3D simulation. We show that the height is the control parameter, but we still have a length scale here, which is the size of the particles. And so we got rid of this length scale by just simulating rocklets in the plane. And it turned out that actually you can also recover the instability just with uh, singularities above the wall. So it really means that here, what drives the instability is purely hydrodynamics. Size effects are negligible or small compared to the effect of the height and hydrodynamics. Even just two lines of rocklets in a stupid MATLAB code will give you this instability. Uh, so what you can notice also as well, uh, when particles are pushed further away from the wall, you can see sometimes that the fingertips can break off from the rest of the suspension. And that was interesting to us, so what we did in our 3D simulations, we increased the repulsive strength of our potential so that the particles will be further away from the wall. And here you will see a video of an example of simulation where here all the, the parameters are the same as before except the height which is increased. And as you let them go, you see that, again, you have the formation of the shot, but now the fingertips break off from the rest of the suspension. 
and they form these structures. So you see a rich dynamic of the structures, you see some of them merging. Uh, it's still a transient state here, but as you let time go, you see that they adopt a steady shape with a steady uh, transition speed, and these are really stable and self-sustained. They don't lose any particle, the simulation could go on forever, and this will remain a stable state. So these particles move or are self-sustained, and what is interesting as well is that they move really fast, of course. They move, uh, so this, for instance, this cluster has a few hundreds of particles, and it moves like 400 of magnitudes faster than one roller at the same position. And this is just due to the superposition of flow fields induced by the rollers around them. So now we have these uh, structures. Again, if you want to understand how they form, you just have to look at the hydrodynamics. Uh, when you look at the flow field around the fingertip in its uh, moving frame, you can see a nice recirculation zone, which means that you're going to have a self-sustained motion inside the recirculation zone. And the size of the recirculation zone, again, is set by the height. Okay? So, uh, let Michel conclude for, for this talk. Okay, so, so that's up. Oh, here. Now you can hear. So, to summarize, we identified this new kind of instability, which is really unique because it seems to just be purely hydrodynamic. Even though a lot of stuff was going on in the experiment, <coughs> It seems like the essence of this can be captured just by the hydrodynamics, and everything is being set by the fluid flow. All that matters is how far my particle is from my wall. And then also we have, at this instability can evolve these stable autonomous clusters, which we think is a really new kind of thing, because here you have things that are compact, and but we don't have any potential between the particles. Everything is just being done by the hydrodynamics. And you can imagine lots of scenarios where a structure like this could be used to do all kinds of cool things. So that's what we're thinking about now. Thanks for your attention. Thank you for the talk. And yeah, I see many questions. Uh, the width of the finger seems to be determined from the very beginning, right? So is there any sort of finger competition or something, or something, something like that? Like, uh, something they do something? Oh, like, like they, no, they seem to, when they merge together, they make the same size structure again. Basically, you just have this one size that is what is showed with the flow field that's stable. So you could have something swallowed in that, but you don't see like a coarsening or anything like that. You see a very slow growth of the rate, but not like a traditional. Do you have a microphone? Can people hear me in the back? It's fine. No, I think he's for it. So, sorry if I just missed this, but how many times does an individual particle rotate in sort of one revolution of the treadmill? Is it? So it's going to be sort of ah, treadmill. that's a really good question. Carl. You... So, yeah, we actually monitor uh, the rotational velocity of this treadmill, uh, but I don't have the numbers and I don't remember the numbers. It's much slower because the spinning frequency that you saw in the videos was like 10 hertz. Uh, and this was a simulation of 100 physical seconds. Uh, and clearly the treadmill was relating much slower uh, because the vorticity induced by these particles is much smaller than their, their uh, rotation rate. So I guess it was, yeah, it was more. So that scales different enough that you don't think it has any role in, I mean, th does, that, does that ratio have any role in, in the way things play out or are they different enough that you don't think that, that has anything to do with it? I don't think it has a strong role though. No. So, uh, Peko Hasoy did a, an experiment where, or did a, I guess, theory for an experiment. You have a, a cylinder, and then you put some water in the bottom, and then you rotate the cylinder, and then you have that front. And basically, the, yeah. the wavelength is set by the tube that can fit through that front. And it kind of seems similar to what you guys have, because the farther up you put your particles, the bigger the tube of particles that's rotating. And that sets the wavelength that's going to uh, uh, be bigger for the larger size tubes, right? So, so you may want to take a look at at some of those uh, yeah, theories. Yeah, there's, there's think, other experiments we just have like viscous fluid flowing down a slope. I forget yeah. what the, the term for that is. And also there you see like a kind of hump develop, and then that's what destabilizes. But we think there's a little bit different physics there because their surface tension is really playing a strong role. Although we do think that the width of the shock might be something that's he's not selecting the link scale, but it might be an important parameter in the problem. I think we're out of time. Yeah, that was a nice quiz. So <laughs> let's